I'm Lori Matsukawa. And I'm Joyce Taylor. And Lori has a big announcement today. I sure do. Um, after 36 years at King 5, I am retiring. No. Ah, say it's not so. It is so <laughs> exciting. But I have to tell you, it's been so whirlwind, so busy here. I really haven't had time to contemplate what retiring means. Or change uh, your mind, <laughs> as hard as we've tried to do that. Right. So it's been, it's been kind of interesting to see how the announcement has been rolling out on social media, on Facebook, on you Twitter. You were in a classroom this morning. I, I was giving a little talk to a classroom of fourth graders, and we're talking about civil liberties and all this kind of thing, and then I get in the car and poof, there are all these tweets and messages, <laughs> congratulations, this and that. I'm like, oh wow, that was fast. It didn't take much time for the word to get out. So a lot of people are probably asking, why 36 years, we love you, don't retire, why have you decided now's a good time? Well, I, I, think, I think I'd like to have some time to spend with family. Mm -hmm. You know, Larry's been retired for about a year, and so Larry and I have some traveling to do, I have to improve my golf game, <laughs> uh, and I really can't, you know, do a lot of that stuff while yeah. I'm still working full time. I'd yeah. like to try it, but You're I don't think I can. You're still young and can go have some fun. Right, right. I really think in retirement, it's not you know that you're not doing not that you're not doing anything. You're doing things, just different things mm -hmm. from going into the office every day mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. and working on the office time schedule. Right. Right. Retirement is a time to do what you want to do at the time you want to do it. Mm -hmm. You know, good for you. And do it when you can still you know when I can still see, hear, and walk, that that's helpful, right? <laughs> and there's some things she's already said she's not going to do, but we're going to save that for the very end, because I thought oh. that was really good advice that you've gotten from others about what to do the first year, or not to do. Mm -hmm. uh, I think a lot of people probably want to know, we're going to take some of your questions, uh, but in the 36 years of broadcasting, you have seen and done so much. So to ask what would be your favorite story or the most memorable, it would be impossible. But what are some right. of the things that you've been able to see as a journalist? As far as perhaps the most uh, challenging and memorable story mm -hmm. uh, that I've covered, it would have to be then Governor Gary Locke's first trade mission to China. Mm -hmm. He was the first, the nation's first Chinese American governor. He was brand new to the office and he was going to go on this trade mission to China. Dave Wyke and I were going to follow the governor right along. And um, it was 10 days, which, you know, back then people would send you on a 10 day assignment, but you know, today, not so much. No. But it was 10 days in China following a very aggressive schedule. And so we were up and at him. He would, you know, we would follow him all day long. And while he is, uh, you know, resting, <laughs> eating dinner, uh, Dave Wyke and I would be editing, writing, and transmitting our stories from China back here to Seattle. Incredible. And it was very challenging because we had to go through the NBC News Bureau in Beijing. We would have all our stories and we would have to like hand in our, this, in the dead of night, hand in our passports through this little slit in the door and the guard would whoosh, take our passports. They would just disappear. And, the gates would open and we'd have to trudge in there with our tapes. And there are all these guards on the side with their guns, you know, watching us carrying our tapes up to the tape room. They would transmit it to Seattle, and while they're transmitting, I had to talk on one of those huge brick phones. Remember the phones back Some then? Some of you don't know what that is. They were the mobile devices that right. looked like bricks. These phones that were about the size of a brick. And I would My have kids to would have no idea what that is. Call the station and say, oh, we're feeding from Beijing. Are you getting it? But this governor went to five different cities, you know, Hong Kong, Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou, uh, and then he went to his ancestral village. For the first time in for, years or for, for the first time ever? His first trip there as governor wow. with his father who, was, uh, who left the village as a young man. So he's there. He's treated like a rock star. They have like royalty. hundreds of young students lining oh, the road wow. into the village, waving flowers and flags, and there are brass bands, and people are cheering, and they're just mobbing him. I mean, the police have to like hold hands and hold back the crowds. Wow. He's so popular. 
and he goes there and he sees the house where his his father was born and raised and it's a very you know very very uh, poor village he didn't have electricity until recently and apparently they moved in a toilet for him but it was not connected or anything like that they just had a toilet there wow. in case he wanted to look at it I guess. I don't but um, it was a, a strenuous trip, but boy, did we cover a lot of stories. We let trade with Boeing and Microsoft and Eddie Bauer and apples and wheat, and he was whirling around China. We went to the Forbidden City. Uh, he got to meet the president of China at the time, Jiang Zemin. It was an incredible, All in 10 days. In incredible experience. Wow. And it was really um, the world's opportunity to see Gary Locke, the first Chinese American governor mm -hmm. in, this, in the United States, and he was a rock star. Yeah, the whole country was crazy about him. It was really amazing to document that and to be there and witness history, right? Which you have done time and again, it's, actually, it, in this job. That's how you? Oh, you saw a picture of Dave Wyke and me in China. That was. Uh, that was us, and here we are on the news desk. Okay, see, there's Dave Wyke and I. We worked together on our 70th anniversary of King 5 documentary, and so we got a little recognition from the company there. Which you should have. Which we were delighted to share with the rest of the newsroom, but uh, Dave Wyke and I have been through quite a bit. You have. You've traveled all over the world, so you've been to China, you've been right. to Vancouver, you covered the Olympic Games. The Olympic Games in Vancouver and Salt Lake City. Mm -hmm. We went to, I've been to Japan a what few times. What was that like? What, the Going Olympics? Going to Japan. Oh, <laughs> Japan. Um, Japan was incredible because the first time uh, I went for King was for a trade mission again, mm -hmm. and it was just amazing to see how interconnected the two places mm -hmm. are. The Boeing airplanes, of course, the Microsoft software, Eddie Bauer was also there, our apples. It was the first time that apples had been allowed in Japan in 25 years. Um, it had been kind of kept out at the time um, for various reasons, including a, a bug. But <laughs> that had been all resolved, and so we were following the Apple Commission into Japan. It was very exciting to see Washington apples in the in marketplace, Japan, right? They're they're auctioning it off and big, and then to walk out into the little towns and see them displayed proudly, Washington's Washington We've shoe, arrived. Washington shoe apples, Aww. right? It's very cute, very yeah. cute, and um, that it was just really, it, it was a time when I think Washington was really making itself known mm -hmm. internationally. Mm -hmm. And so we are benefiting from those years. This was must have been 30 years we're ago. We're benefiting now. We're in so benefiting many ways. from all of those um, outreach trips that were made back then. Wow. Yeah. So much has happened. I know. In, in terms of trade, et cetera, because and, and of those always, relationships. They always talk to journalists about how uh, what we do is writing the first page of history. And it's so true because uh, when you and I were covering the the implosion of the kingdom. Mm -hmm. Remember, we were all live, all over the place, you know, saying, hey, here comes the kingdom, it's going to be imploded. And when I was watching it come down, I said, you know, there are so many viewers who remember when they were building it. Of course. Building the kingdom in the mid-70s was a huge deal. And then we saw, we saw it come down. And End of um, an era, start of a new one. The start of a new field. one. And it's like, wow, you know, we were here documenting it, and now History. it's being read in the history books, right? Yeah. So true. We yeah. must have questions. We do. Yes. There are some, okay. Um, lots of well wishes as okay. well. Of course. Sec Lucy, for example, said, Lori's been delivering the news to me my entire life. Thank you for all you've done. Thanks, Lucy. Do you have a Lucy. favorite sort of interaction with viewers? Have there been some ones that have stuck out in your mind as they've come up to you? And a favorite well, interaction with viewers. There have been so many. And viewers are just so wonderful. They always say, you're in my bedroom every <laughs> night. Do, do you, you must get yes. that too. Mine is in the morning. morning <laughs> but it's like, a, oh, you're in my bedroom every night. And they think it's like <laughs> the most original <laughs> joke. But I, I appreciate that because it means that they're watching, right? right? And so I, I and appreciate they know you. that. I appreciate that. So to this day, people still call me Connie. And I can't understand. I don't know if they mean Connie, Connie Chung, Chung or Connie Thompson. But I really don't think I look like either of them so I don't right. know what they say when they call me Connie and but I've been called Kathy okay <laughs> like Gertson, Kathy Gertson who we adored and missed ter terribly, missed her terribly but, right yeah but so I mean so. and I look nothing like Kathy so 
But I the, think it's because of television. Right? But I think viewers, by and large, are just very, uh, well, they're very supportive and they're very um, sincere when mm -hmm. they say thank you. They're, they're very grateful. They say thank you for covering X. Whatever that story is, mm -hmm. they're usually very thankful that an issue that was important to them got on our air right. or that we talked to someone that they knew that they felt strongly about. So, yeah, yeah it's been pretty positive, I would say. Viewers are so wonderful. You are yeah. always so wonderful. Okay, what other questions? What other Cheryl questions? Cheryl asks, what advice would you give women who are interested in working in journalism? Ah, okay, good question. We should, we should both answer that. Okay, first of all, um, definitely women should get a lot of experience while they're still in school, if possible. Mm -hmm. If you're a college student, you know, start <coughs> writing those articles, getting on TV, start a blog do Facebook Live and YouTube, you know, practice, 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 just do journalism as much as you can. And, uh, and read as much as you can about right. current events and know what's going on around you in your community, in the world, read, right. absorb information. And especially now during this Me Too time, it's important to not worry so much about what you look like. A lot of times they say, well, uh, should I put on all this kind of makeup or this mm -hmm. kind of clothing? I think you just have to look fairly well kept, you know, neat and clean and uh, don't worry so much about what you look like or, or your body or anything like that. But think about the story and I think that's the most important thing. If you're communicating the story, people aren't really looking at your clothes, they're listening to your story. And uh, you bring up an interesting thing too because we're in this sort of social me generation, but in journalism to me, I'm not the story. And so in storytelling and in journalism, the story is not, you're not part of the story. It's you're searching for the story and telling someone else's story. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so I always try to keep that in mind. It's not about me, it's about finding the story of somebody else. Okay. If you become part of the story, it's not a good thing. It's not the best. <laughs> it's not a good thing, right? One thing that I do want to tell our viewers here is that uh, while I am retiring, uh, Joyce Taylor is going to be taking the evening anchor chair. And I, I will be just attempting so to slide in. Just so my best. thrilled by that choice so because, because of your experience and because you. I mean, you went to Western Washington University for Pete's sake. You're the local gal. Go Vikings. So there you go. You know, yeah. it's important to have that kind of connection to the area and the knowledge of the history, mm -hmm. kind of like that institutional memory mm -hmm. so that um, our viewers can benefit from that and, and the newcomers who come to our town can, can benefit from that. So exciting. I'm so I'm glad. So, I am so honored, honestly. <laughs> and I, I, I've, I've thought about this. It's, it's only taken 30 years. <laughs> and it's been worth the wait because who are the women who've come before me? So you, mm -hmm. Jean Anderson. And Jean. Uh -huh. um, there have been others, at, at, of course, the other stations who've also helped right. to pave the way. But two extraordinary journalists, amazing storytellers. <laughs> Could I have had two? Are more incredible women and journalists and people to learn from? I don't think so. Well, let's talk a little bit about the industry and how it's changed. When I first came to Seattle, um, there weren't that many women on the air and there weren't that many women of color on the air. No. So this was something that was some a priority for me. I said, okay, I'm here, but I don't want to be the only one. Mm -hmm. So um, a couple of buddies of mine, uh, Ron Chu and um, Frank Abe, we started a chapter called the Asian American Journalists Association. You're the co-founder right? of that. We had our mm -hmm. Seattle chapter established. We were the third chapter in the nation of this a AAJA group. And the whole purpose was to encourage aspiring journalists of color, particularly Asian American, but all journalists of color, and to call out when the coverage was insensitive or um, lacking in knowledge, and to just kind of encourage the journalists who were already there because there were a few journalists of color at the time, but they needed to be held up, propped mm -hmm. up, encouraged, applauded, you know, they needed support. And so that was a really important turning point for me, I think, mm -hmm. because once there are journalists of color on TV, writing for the newspapers, mm -hmm. blogging, uh, it encourages viewers and others to say, hey, this is something I can do. Right. Right? And then they just, will come into the industry. We have to prime the pump was my own and my it's, phrase. Prime it's exactly the pump. that thing. So and, and for me, not just you and Jean, but Mickey Flowers and mm -hmm. Connie Thompson. Yeah. So someone like me growing up, if you don't see someone who looks like right. you on television then you don't really believe that it, you can do mm -hmm. that thing. That right. How many people doing? have told you, right? Oh, because you look like me, 
uh, I feel and like I can do that. And the highest compliment when someone says I'm going sure. into television because I want to be able to do what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And I'm a reflection of them. Right. So it's, it's the best thing ever. So, so it was, I mean, it's now we kind of take diversity for, for granted, but at the time. 30 years ago. Right. At the time no. we had to kind of like start with baby steps mm -hmm. and give scholarships to students so that they would enter the field of communication and journalism. And then once they got there, we had to provide them job fairs so that they could get their first job. And once they got their first job, encourage them to get the second and third jobs mm -hmm. and, and just kind of be this kind of pathway. And so it was kind of trailblazing at the time. But uh, thankfully, I also had very supportive managers who would send me to conventions and mm -hmm. who would support the scholarship programs. So, and still do. Yeah, and still do. Yeah. And so they, they saw the value of it because they want to hire a diverse group of staff. and. You know, it, it just kind of worked, but it took and time. And it's the same for the National Association of Black Journalists, mm -hmm. which also has a local chapter, national, and d doing things all together now. But 30 years ago, that there was no such thing right. as that kind of camaraderie even between the groups. Or it's many, many cities didn't yep. have it, even a chapter. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. again, trailblazer. What are you going to miss the most? What do, are, there many, must be many things, the people, of course, but what are you going to miss? I, I the daily am. grind of covering television news. When I first got into the business, I said I wanted a job where I would learn something new every day, mm -hmm. and this job does that. It does. It provides you new knowledge every single day, and I'm going to miss the people that you meet while you're acquiring that knowledge. Mm -hmm. People are so smart. People have amazing experiences and I get to talk to these people. I think that's what I'm going to miss the most. And I'm not talking about movie stars necessarily or big, you know, no. NFL stars or anything like that. I'm talking about just everyday folks, students, elderly, you know, the guy who bags groceries. Mm -hmm. They have everyone has a story. They have amazing things Everybody to say. Everybody has a story, don't you mm -hmm. find? Right? If you right. just peel it back yeah. a little bit more, you find every <laughs> everyone has a story. It's so interesting. So what got you into the business originally? I mean, w w did you always want to be a journalist or did you? From, I w from about ninth grade, okay. I knew I wanted to be a storyteller. Okay. Actually, being on television wasn't necessarily part of the plan. No. Mm -hmm. but I was incredibly nosy and inquisitive. <laughs> And a process of elimination, I knew what I didn't really want to do. Mm -hmm. I always thought I wanted to be a pediatrician, but that didn't really work out because I didn't want to work in hospitals, etc. Process okay. of elimination. But I love storytelling and, and very nosy, always asking questions. And then what? And how did that happen? And then what? Ha you know, that mm -hmm. kind of thing. And so just always wanting to have a front seat and being in the know, mm -hmm. wanting to know what, what is going to happen, what, why did things happen. Just and of I course, think the Western, storytelling. And Western has one of the had better great, journalism great programs, programs in the state, too. That they're actually resurrecting and expanding. Yeah. So it's going to be a great place for journalism. That's it's true. great. See, yeah. that's great. Why did you? Why, how did you? You were going to be a piano teacher. <laughs> I was going to be a piano teacher, really. Did you know that? <laughs> and so, what? Piano teacher journalist. Yeah. How did that happen? It sounds very bizarre. Uh, but long story short, I was looking for scholarship money because my parents were school teacher, public school teachers. They didn't make a lot of money. So uh, a friend of mine said, hey, you ought to enter this contest. It's Miss Teenage America. And if you win, you get a $10,000 scholarship. And you I had said, never entered wow. a contest like that oh, before. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> but, but this is the thing. He says, and the best part is there's no bathing suit contest, so you might have a chance. <laughs> 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 Thanks. <laughs> so I did. They they judge you on a on current events test, um, poise and personality, how you interview, and a talent. So um, piano. Right. So for my for Miss Teenage Honolulu, which I had to do first, I did play the piano. But when I won the title for the local title and went to the national pageant. Um, I decided to do something else. So all during high school, I was in a choir, the IAEA Swinging Singers, and we put on <laughs> a Polynesian show, you know, in Waikiki and all around town. And so I did a Maori poi ball dance as part of this show. So I said, I'll do my Maori poi ball dance as my talent in the Miss Teenage America pageant. And uh, because I figured everyone was going to play the piano. Mm -hmm. So. <laughs> I did my little poi ball dance and totally did not expect to win this pageant because I had never entered a pageant and I, I was from Hawaii, you know, Miss Teenage America and, the, and you know, right. Asian American person, I don't know, but and I won, won the pageant. And so, and $10,000. And, and, and Look at our, you. There I am, is Miss Teenage America Adorable. in Japan. 
I got to be homecoming queen that year. So the senior year, uh, the, Look and at there's it, the, I love that they don't picture. give you a crown, they give you a little medallion. So And you, the shock on your face the is shock, priceless. The shock. And so uh, when you're Miss Teenage America, you spend half the year just going to school and being normal. That was my senior year. And then the other half of the year, you travel. So I traveled across the United States, and the kimono shot was when I went to Japan, right there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it says, Rori Rei Matsukawa, there on the sash. And our yeah. sponsor, you can see me holding it in my hand, is a bottle of Dr. Pepper. <laughs> Dr. Pepper was our <laughs> national sponsor. And so Love I got it. to go to Japan because they were opening a new bottling plant in Japan. So it was just a wonderful experience. So And so everywhere I went as Miss Teenage America, I was writing interviewed, about you. Right? I was right. interviewed by newspaper people and TV people and radio, and I said, Hey, this is a pretty good job. You get paid to go someplace and talk to people. I can and, do that. And ask whatever you want I to. I can do that. So you fell in love with it. So I decided at that moment, I said, OK, I think I'll be a, a journalist. Because really? I thought it would be great to interview all kinds of people. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that was it. And from there, it says, OK, here we go. Let's do it. And you've been in love with it ever since, yeah. obviously. But I was going to be a print, I don't know about you, but I was going to be a print reporter first hmm. because uh, they didn't have pr uh, a broadcast program where I went to school. I went to Stanford and they didn't have at the time a broadcast program. So I just did print reporting. How lame, Stanford. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. And, uh, and then so how did you part like that? How, how did you get in television then? So um, one of the internships I did was at KPIX, mm -hmm. and uh, it was a you know television station in San Francisco, and it was because my print managing editor at the Honolulu Advertiser said, "Hey, you ever thought of doing TV reporting? You know they hire women these days." <laughs> That's how long ago. They You've hire women these way. days. Uh, maybe you should think about television. I said, eh. So that's when I got the internship. And I applied for both kinds of jobs. Mm -hmm. And I eventually got my first TV job in Redding, California. Um, I remember making that decision in the Greyhound bus station. Because really? I had gotten, at the same day, I got an offer from the Los Angeles Times, right? They needed a business reporter. And, so and I'm you like, picked the TV one. Right. So I'm in R Redding TV. Los Angeles Times, what were you print? thinking? But I thought, this was what I was thinking. I said, you know, television is a young person's job. You have to be able to carry the gear and be on TV. And I said, when I'm wrinkled and toothless, I can go back and be a print reporter. That Good was, call. Wrinkled <laughs> and toothless. So I'm, <laughs> I'm never at I'm still waiting, but you know, you could, I figured I could always fall back on print, but uh, mm. I, I just love TV. Has it been everything you hoped it would be? It has been. And I think um, it kind of culminated after all these years in uh, my ability to collect the stories I've been covering all these years and have a very large project that covered the in incarceration of Japanese Americans during World really War II. really meaningful to you. Exactly because the internment and the incarceration experience started. I mean, the very first Japanese Americans to be sent to camp came from Bainbridge Island, Washington. And uh, the, the experience, how it affected the people here, and then the chance to get it redressed, to have, it, um, to have this nation apologize and to reimburse these people who had been uh, so terribly treated and had their constitutional Victimized. rights taken away. Right. Um, that movement had a lot of uh, grassroots support and mm -hmm. leadership here in Seattle. Mm -hmm. And now there is a lot of uh, artistic reinterpretation and interpretation of what happened. Our opera, we have operas mm -hmm. and movies and plays and books and all kinds of artistic people retelling the story to make sure we don't forget, forget. it. Forget, right. because if we forget, we are doomed to repeat it. And we just can't have that kind of wholesale trampling on constitutional rights. Right. Again, no, right. not here. And this, you say, culminated because you just did this in the past year. In the past couple of years, right. And for which you won an Emmy. But it <laughs> was a year-long yeah. project. It I was mean, a year-long year project. project. Because you had to find and interview and, and research. And basically kind of drag boxes and boxes of old tapes and stories mm -hmm. out, of the, out of storage that I had under my desk and at home in the closet and say, oh, I remember doing this story. And remember how we talked about the writing the first draft of right. history. That's what it was. I had been covering these stories over the years and finally said, hey, I should put it together like a, like a 
like a story, like a book, a like a history mm -hmm. documentary, so that we can see the whole arc of the story. From the and understand it from end. beginning to end yeah. in one piece. It's, so. it's extraordinary if you haven't seen it. It's online, I, I'm oh. sure. Do we have more questions? Uh, yeah. Yvonne asks, Gloria, <laughs> is your family excited for this next chapter to kind of get you full time? <laughs> the family is very hey, excited. Oh, they're happy. That's when we were married. How many years ago was that? We figured oh. it was 37 years ago. It was just before I got here. And uh, Larry has been retired for a year, as I said, and he's been kind of waiting for me to get off this e this night schedule. You know, it requires me to work until 11.30 at night. I don't get home until after midnight. And uh, he says, you know, that's that's a pretty hard schedule to keep. You know, He's kind of over that. Doing it for so many years. <laughs> yeah. And so um, it'll be good because we have a lot of traveling to do. And uh, we, I still have family in Hawaii. Mm. And our son lives in California. And you know how it is with kids. Mm -hmm. You want to visit them right. where they are. Right. Right. And so, well, they still want to visit you. <laughs> they still want to see you. Well, you still can walk toward them. And uh, so there's just a lot of things to do. But when people say, oh, are you going to teach? Are you going to do this job or that job? I tell them, mm-mm. For the first year, I've been told by many people who have retired, they said, for the first year, don't commit to anything. Just no boards. Just be. Yeah. No boards. No clubs. No, you know, work. Don't don't grab a the first job offer that comes. They said, just take a year to be, not mm. be retired. Just be. be. And are you going to actually do that? I am. I think that's a really good advice. We'll revisit this a year <laughs> from now because oh, there's Tell, the shot. What is that picture? Ends. Okay, I love that shirt because you notice it has my name on the back. Yes, it's a gift from the Mariners when we first moved into this building, Home Plate Center. We are neighbors, and it was like our welcome to the neighborhood gift from the Seattle Mariners. So all of the on-air folks got their own Mariners shirt with their names on we the did. back. We did. We did. And so that was a great way to, okay, uh, I love these guys. Slick Watts on the right. Yep. And then Freddie Brown on the left. Uh, they, Institutions, legends, they local are, legends. They are supporting the neighborhood. And, okay, I had to get this. I got Lock so it. many people. Oh, my gosh. And they say, oh, isn't he darling? I said, yes. He's very darling, but he's also a very community-minded person. Yeah, yes. You know, volunteering. Of course. Who is? Oh, Walt. it's Walt. Mr. Jones. Yep. Mr. Oh. Jones. He's quite who is doing quite a bit taller than you. He is doing <laughs> color commentary <laughs> for King Five Sports. And, and uh, the boys. And we love to clown around. Mark oh, Wright. Oh, it's a doll. I'm yes. so excited to work with him Jordan again. Jordan Steele with the lemon in his mouth and Craig Herrera. Okay, so Craig and Mark and I were doing um, Home Team Harvest earlier mm. this year. We were in Redmond, I believe, and you were in... I was in Redmond. You were in Redmond? This no, we year were in Everett. You. you were in we Everett. Were in Everett. I, was, I was thinking, I don't remember you being in Redmond with me, but I was in Redmond last year. And you were in You were in Redmond last year with me. Yes. So. And yeah. so, the, and there you and I are. The 70th anniversary special right? that you did. At Mohai. Mm -hmm. What was that like when you were watching all of those old videos and interviews with people who worked here in the past? Well, t I had two sort of experiences taping that. We could not get it all in an hour. Mm -hmm. I mean, right, we couldn't cover it all in an hour. Right. And so it made me relive sort of my f early days here when I first arrived and think of all of the great reporters. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, didn't, we couldn't really do a story about all of the reporters like Jack Hammond and Julie Blackwell and all of the great journalists who I learned from mm -hmm. when I first arrived and I was 27. Right. And I was, <laughs> talk about green, ah. new, and a child mm -hmm. in that group and just how much I learned and how lucky I was, I still pinch myself, mm -hmm. and how lucky I was to be able to come and work in this newsroom 30 years ago. And that was so wonderful because they weren't uh, shy about sharing what they knew no. and they weren't, you know, you know, so stuck on themselves that they wouldn't no. reach out and help the Almost green people felt like obligated us. obligated right? to take you under their wing and show you the ropes right. so that you would get it right. Right? Yeah, no, I was mm. very, very lucky. They said, do you want to know how the city hall works? Do you want to know how the courts work? Let me work? show you how do it's you know done. How it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really. Don't be intimidated by this guy. Yeah, Chase yeah. him down the street. I said, okay, we'll do that. But, you know, the, the expectation was clear. The bar was very high. Mm -hmm. And the legacy that Dorothy Bullitt established that still lives in all of us today mm -hmm. was very apparent then as it is now. Yep. Yep. Isn't it? Mm -hmm. It is. Mm -hmm. And I think... Um, 
that's that's kind of the, our responsibility and then the next generation's yes. responsibility to keep that legacy going keep in mind someone what, yeah. asked me today because you were out doing a community event yeah and I, I said you know uh, we were talking about filling your shoes legitimately <laughs> I said you know the thing is when I get more rest I'm going to have to really step up because Lori does a lot of community events <laughs> which I'm gonna be able to do when I have more sleep that's right and they said but do you really do you really have to do more community events and I said oh no that is part of working here. That is right. part of Dorothy Bullitt's mission. One of mm -hmm. the pillars of working at King, mm -hmm. which you have always lived up to and set an example for all of us, that that's part of not just our brand, but of who we are as a station, right. is part of community service. It's, it's kind of, you're an, doing an three or four times a week. It's not an obligation. I, I don't do it four times a week. But, but it's part of who we are. It's it's part of who we are, and it's, it's kind of uh, something that it's a privilege. It's a, it's it a, is. First of all, it's a privilege to have the job we have. And as part of that, we, it's, mm -hmm. it behooves us right. to kind of share our time, share our mm -hmm. expertise, share our enthusiasm, mm -hmm. you know, and get mm -hmm. other organizations, you know, experienced with the feeling of success. And I think, too, now more than ever, especially with young people, when we talk about journalism and the need to encourage people to get mm -hmm. into this business, right. um, it's uh, as important yeah. now as it ever was. We have to be out there. Right. We have to be out right. there. Right. Anything else? Yes. Okay. Um, Brian asked, what are your hopes for the next generation? Oh, oh good goodness. question, Brian. We're just leading into that. Mm -hmm. My hope for the next generation is that, one, they learn to spell. <laughs> it's really important, you know. We're such a, a verbal uh, society these days that we don't often think that spelling matters, but spelling does matter. Mm -hmm. I think proper grammar matters. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, and then, and then, less facetiously perhaps, I really want them to be thoughtful. I want the next generation to be thoughtful. And when they go out and cover a story, I want them to think about, is this story true? Uh, do the people care? Is there is there a benefit for me covering this story? You know, are, are people going to be hurt? And in what way? And how should that inform the way I do this story? I mm -hmm. want people to be thoughtful. Mm -hmm. So spelling and thoughtfulness. Mm -hmm. What about you? Do you know what I think too? Can I just add to that? I want them to be more connected this way <laughs> and less connected this way. I agree. I, I agree. want them to, like, I love the iPhone, I love mobile devices, but I want kids to be more connected mm -hmm. with each other. Mm -hmm and not on devices because I think they're losing that. Well, and I think that's why you and I like to get out in the community mm -hmm. and do these uh, events. Mm -hmm. It's because it does put you in contact with people. Mm -hmm. And you end up sitting you know, with some extraordinary achievers, people right. who've done extraordinary things. Their story may never be on TV, but then again, mm -hmm. they might because we're out there talking right. to them and we might say, you know, your story should be on there. Right, and imagine what you might be missing if you put this down for a week, the time that you spend on this device, if you put it down for that much time, how much could you see? Mm -hmm. yep. How much can you talk to someone and exchange with yep. someone? Mm -hmm. So, so that's yeah, my okay. wish for the world. Yeah, here we go, connection, right? Yeah, and Connect. thoughtfulness. Any yeah. other questions? It's all just a bunch of well wishes and people Yay. saying, don't go. Okay, okay. So maybe some, some details. Um, my last day is officially the June 14th. June 14th. That's a Friday. Big S show planned. Uh oh. An hour long special. Uh oh. All about you. <laughs> Some surprises built in. The 14th okay. of June. Okay, 14th of June. And you'll be on the anchor disc on the after that. 16th. No. What, what would that be? The 17th of June. Okay. The Monday She'll be after on the that. Evening anchor so five desk. weeks from now ish. But even before that, you're going to be joining us and well, no, we're going to be, be doing some funny things. To probably feature stories about Lori. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just be popping up and down. Uh -huh. But yeah, no. We're just going to, we're really going to spend the next several weeks celebrating your career and talking about some of your accomplishments, some of the, your favorite stories. You've covered oh. so many amazing things. So we're going to be featuring some of that over yeah. the next many weeks. And the thing is, people have been so welcoming and they mm -hmm. share their story ideas and they share their lives with us and I think I know we're so I think lucky we're really lucky and, and I mean it when we're privileged and because we have this kind of position we really should use it for the community's yeah. good and so, so we do I'm just going to say on behalf of all of you 
We are so grateful and thank you so much for all of your years of giving to all of us, all of us. <laughs> and you can still change your mind. Uh, I'm not going to change my mind, but, but we love congratulations you so much. To oh you. my gosh. All the best. It's so we're neighbors and we're neighbors in the newsroom, so I still am going to get to see you. Yep. So, but we're going to miss you in the newsroom. Oh, it's thanks, not Joyce. going to be the same <laughs> at all without Lori in the newsroom, but maybe you'll come back and visit from time to time. Leaving the people is the hardest thing. All right. If you have more questions, send them on Facebook, and if she has a minute or two, maybe you can pop in and answer Absolutely. them. Absolutely. All right. Bye, babe. Bye-bye, guys.